It was the most jagged piece of the Brexit puzzle, the very hardest to place. A piece which would keep Northern Ireland's goods, its products, its foodstuffs, its imports and exports flowing across Ireland without a border alongside. That piece was the Northern Ireland Protocol, where Northern Ireland would not quite be in the EU, but not entirely aligned with the UK, betwixt and between. The protocol keeps goods flowing across the border on this island without impediment, but at a cost. And the cost was a new border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A border which affects the billions of agricultural exports from NI to GB. The Prime Minister promised free, unfettered access to and from the GB market. But it isn't happening, in some cases, at a very significant cost. Our trade to, uh, to GB is neither free nor frictionless. Yes, it is continuing to happen, but it's neither free nor frictionless. Um, there's cost in our processing industries, there's issues with haulage because there's less stuff coming from GB and there's a mountain of paperwork to fill. Yes, government stepping in and GB side to fill some of that paperwork and, and pay some of that for some of that, but it's definitely not all been, been sorted. UK passport in this pocket and an Irish passport in that pocket and we can take out whichever one suits us. Uh, because of our unique position and to keep everything going and to keep the Good Friday Agreement and all, we need that on our food relayed over our food. And I don't think this is impossible. I think of the political walls there. But that is no longer so easy. As much as it was about what we make and what we sell, Brexit was about sovereignty. And sovereignty is about choices. A choice about which club you're in. And the choice Boris Johnson made was to establish an economic border within his own country to soften Northern Ireland's Brexit so he could make Great Britain's harder. The sum of that choice has been in place for six weeks and it's already affecting the internal market of the UK. Well, the big challenge that we have is that GB suppliers are either unaware, unprepared or unwilling to supply. With the unaware and the unprepared, you can work with those people. The unwilling is a big, big problem for us. Uh, those aren't teething problems. Uh, so even inside one month, a quarter of all manufacturers in Northern Ireland have reorientated their supply chain. But though the economics in Great Britain might catch up with Northern Ireland, the politics here are of a different order. The DUP and loyalists are calling for the abandonment of the protocol. Sinn Féin and nationalists vociferously want to retain it. It is another cleavage atop the old, an unpredictable element to a politics where unpredictability is always unwelcome. In recent years, however uneasy the peace, the players came to accept the rules as set up by the Good Friday Agreement, the political and economic structures which came to govern this place. But that is no longer the case. One big part of the political community does not accept the protocol or its auspices. And we cannot yet know what effect that injection of instability, that shaking of the consensus might augur. These twin truths that there is now less consensus and less consent about how Northern Ireland is to be governed poses uncomfortable questions for both sides of the divide. Isn't it deeply irresponsible for you to argue to abandon it entirely, particularly when it isn't clear what the replacement will be? Wouldn't it be far better to do as what many of the businesses that we've been speaking to today suggest, which is for you to work to build on the protocol, to iron out the problems that they're having? Well, first of all, no, it's not, uh, because it's important that people understand just how uh, much the protocol is having an impact on the ordinary lives of citizens here in Northern Ireland. Uh, the Prime Minister promised uh, unfettered access from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. We do have unfettered access from Northern Ireland into Great Britain, but certainly not from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. And Finance Minister, if, if I may as well, isn't it the case that nationalists also have to accept that it is a big problem for the politics of Northern Ireland that the unionist community are so hostile to the protocol. So I think that the, the of course there are difficulties that arise from that, that we recognise that we didn't want to be in this place. Uh, the protocol was put in place to try and mitigate against the difficulties which were going to arise from the British state leaving the European Union, uh, but that's where we are. There's little to bind those positions together. But for Foster, it's not Sinn Féin or London or Brussels to whom she's speaking now, but Lan and Ballymena, her own voters, an eye to next year's assembly elections where other unionist forces damning her party for letting all this happen lie in wait.
No, I would be running on the basis that we need to save the union, that we need to dismantle the protocol, uh, that we need a mandate uh, to utterly repudiate the protocol, and that we need to be treated as we should be as an integral part of the United Kingdom. The protocol is the very antithesis of being an integral part of the United Kingdom, and that constitutional damage must be remedied. Michael Gove and his EU counterpart met tonight about the protocol. Previously, they had resolved to try to iron out the problems. But what about the next problem, and the one after that? There are those who fear that with every EU-UK tussle, a querulous old couple who cannot each quite escape the other, that it's Northern Ireland which will feel the fallout. A fallout that with a politics riven, an economy enfeebled, it cannot absorb. Lewis Goodall, we did ask the government to come onto the programme to discuss this, but they declined. In a moment, we'll talk to Sir David Liddington, former Minister for the Cabinet Office and Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster. But first, Tony Connolly, the Europe editor for RTE and author of Brexit and Ireland. Tony, how do you see this playing out politically and, and, and how would you describe the mood at the moment? Well, I think both sides tried to lower the temperature with their statement this evening, even though it was uh, quite obviously a frank uh, discussion between uh, Maral Shevchevich and Michael Gove, but they seem determined to work within the structures they have, uh, the Joint Committee, the Specialised Committee, there are all these, oh, there's all this architecture that was created by the withdrawal agreement. So, so that's obviously a positive. Uh, but for the EU, I think they feel that, yes, the European Commission made a, a dreadful mistake with the attempted triggering of Article 16 a few weeks ago, um, and that that gave the UK a, an opportunity to, to raise the stakes and raise the issue, but they, they feel that that has somewhat been overdone uh, by London, and that at the same time the UK hasn't implemented the agreement that both sides reached in December to implement the protocol and within that agreement, there are flexibilities and arrangements there, which the EU certainly believe uh, should be pursued. Uh, and that is reflected in the statement tonight that they will implement what was agreed in December. So, so that's obviously a positive step. But the kinds of derogations and flexibilities that Michael Gove has spoken about uh, are simply not a runner in terms of a two-year derogation for the uh, an extension of the grace periods for some of those uh, animal products coming over or animal derived products coming over to northern ireland from great britain um, these are probably a bridge too far for for member states at the moment who feel that they've put four maybe five years of effort into ensuring no hard border and they feel that ultimately the protocol has to be given time to work do you think it can work? I suppose that's the, if you zoom out, there'll be some listening to this thinking, well, this, this, this just isn't working, or should we just view it as teething issues? I mean, I, th I think we shouldn't understate uh, or underestimate the difficulties that this is posing to people uh, across the board. These are very onerous uh, and novel uh, checks and controls that, that traders who've traded seamlessly for years have to suddenly come to terms with uh, and you know that there is a real footprint uh, in terms of uh, availability of goods in supermarkets but at the same time there is evidence that some companies uh, freight companies traders customs agents are starting to see uh, companies getting used to the to the new formalities uh, this takes time we're, we're six or seven weeks into it uh, and the eu's view is that you know that should be given time to work uh, and then beyond that, if there are other flexibilities or facilitations which can be worked at within the framework of the protocol, uh, then that can certainly be entertained. But uh, they're not looking at wholesale changes to what was already agreed. Tony Connolly, thank you for that. Well, I can now talk to Sir Dave, David Liddington, former Minister for the Cabinet Officer and de facto Deputy Prime Minister in Theresa May's government. Uh, good evening. You yeah, always you. knew the Northern Ireland Protocol in this form was going to be a problem. Theresa May didn't go for it. She famously said no border down the Irish Sea. She also said no British Prime Minister would go for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was of the view, I remain of the view that uh, the arrangement Theresa May negotiated would have been better for Northern Ireland than the protocol that we, we have now. But you know, that, that's, you know, water under the bridge. That, that's, that's history we can't revisit that Parliament decided differently. Parliament in the United Kingdom decided differently. I'm just bringing it up, uh, if you like, to, to remind people that there was a large 
uh, argument about how difficult yeah. this could be, well, I mean, pu pu purely because we are in the midst of a pandemic. And I, and I, I suppose what I wanted to get from you is, 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 is a refocus on, on how difficult this is and how we can move forward. The, the, the fundamentals here are that uh, there, there are only three things that can happen as regards Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is the one bit of the UK that has a land border with the EU single market. Either the UK stays in the EU customs union and single market, or you have some sort of checks between UK territory and EU territory, i.e. between the North and the South, and that would undoubtedly cause not only some severe economic friction for business, but also cause major political instability. In, and I've sat with people in Newry and Londonderry, Derry and, and Enniskillen and heard that direct from them. Or you have checks um, of some kind between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is where the Johnson government has ended up with, with its protocol. What I, what I hope both parties will do, I rather agreed with Tony, Tony's analysis of what's happened today. I think I'm, I am more hopeful, given the tone of the statement that's come out from Michael Gove and Maros uh, Shevkovich uh, this evening. Um, it, it, both sides need to focus above everything upon the fact that Northern Ireland is still a very fragile society. The EU, from the very start of the negotiations post the referendum, has said that they regarded the peace process and reconciliation in Northern Ireland as absolutely fundamental to the EU's interests and and therefore i i and also know that a tiny bit of overall uh, trade into the uh, the european single market so i think we should say to both the, the uk government and to the eu put the political stability and welfare of northern ireland above everything else get down and sort out the nitty-gritty of some of these um, frictions on trade where you can get ameliorations to the protocol. I don't think you can just sweep away the, the protocol. There's nothing else that's there to be put in its place. It means the whole trade deal with the EU coming down, I think, if, if, if you try doing that. Um, but but also from the EU to the EU, I would say, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm afraid what happened with the invocation of Article 16 over vaccine has had a massive political impact on even moderate unionist opinion. The last thing that's in anybody's interest is for the protocol to become the defining, dividing issue between unionist and nationalist voters in the run up to a Stormont election that happens in 2022, which will be looking to a 2024 date when Stormont decides whether to continue with or dispense with the protocol entirely. And, and for the protocol to become a matter that divides communities on sectarian lines would introduce a new poison into Northern Ireland. And we all, you know, Brussels, London, anywhere in Europe, have an interest in stopping that. And I suppose that's the, that's the bigger prize to, to make sure you get this right. It is that it is corrected in some way. But there'll be people watching this thinking, I thought we sorted all of this out. Well, the, the fact is that both Northern Ireland is fragile uh, that the, the the UK's decision, the decision of the British people to leave the European Union meant that there were bound to be frictions and greater costs imposed to one one extent or another on trade. And, and the, there's a trade-off between um, the degree of sovereignty and uh, national independence or decision-making that you want to take on the one hand and privileged access to the European market on the other. The more independent sovereignty you want, the, the less privileged access you're going to get to the European markets. There's a trade-off there. So I would say, well, I would back Michael Gove in saying, um, you know, well, let's test whether in negotiations the EU is prepared to extend some of these uh, sort, of, sort of transitional arrangements further. But of course, the quid pro quo will be the UK having to agree, probably in some binding legal form, uh, that we will comply with EU standards on, say, foodstuffs, uh, and manufactured goods during any such extension. For the EU's part, I would be saying, please come off your high horse over refusing to talk about a veterinary agreement that would simplify checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland on um, meat and on livestock. The EU's got a veterinary agreement with New Zealand, for goodness sake. Um, the UK follows to the letter, it's in our law, all the rules the EU uh, applies to uh, uh, to uh, food and, and, and livestock. So I can't see 
a reason in principle why there should not be a veterinary well, agreement. We, and we will see. Fact, peace and reconciliation and stability in Northern Ireland. And that is something that is in the interests of the UK, all parts of the UK yes. and all parts of the EU as well. We will see where this comes out. So David Liddington, thank you for your time and analysis there.